The following program is paid for by the Rick and Rick at Night Show. I still love that intro music. This is Rick and Rick at Night. We're the voice of liberty here in the Ohio River Valley. I'm Rick Roos. My partner Rick Berry and I are delighted to be here once again. How are you, Bulldog? I'm doing great. And uh... I'd like to say hi to all our listeners out there. And uh, I anticipate a great show tonight. So let's. Uh, we're still waiting on our, our caller to call in, but uh, I'm sure he's going to be calling in any minute now. We'd like to shout out to and express our true thanks to our friend Doc and DuPont and so many others who have served our country so valiantly. We'd also like to say patriotic greetings to our friends at Harry Stone Grill tonight, who, along with Chair Lisa, are listening to our broadcast live. Area folks are welcome to join these patriots at 621 Clifty Drive here in Madison, Indiana. That's where we're going to be going in, in a few, well, in about 60 minutes. But... Um, we got. I think you went to see uh, 2016. I went down to see it last night. You know, I thought it would be a good idea if I saw that movie before I interviewed the guy that uh, d- that produced it and directed it. So yeah, I did go down to see it, and uh, we went we went uh, up at uh, Columbus a couple weekends ago and took the boys and uh, uh, heck of a movie, heck of a movie, and, and uh, it was interesting uh, reading some of the. Um, uh, questions about from Dinesh D'Souza basically this wasn't a George Soros or you know somebody part of the vast right wing cabal they had apparently 25 guys that put up uh, several hundred thousand dollars and uh, put this on and then they borrowed money to uh, market it yeah you know and the thing that struck me Rick is it really it wasn't a hit piece um in, in my opinion, it was just D'Souza had, had a, uh, a theory as to why Obama th- apparently thinks the way he does and is doing the things he's doing. And he traced it back to, uh, to his father, you know, a father he never really knew. But uh, evidently, evidently that left, left some kind of empty spot in the president's heart, and he's trying to make up for that through his actions as the president. I mean, that's what I took away from it. And uh, I thought D'Souza did a great job. I mean, I don't think they went overboard with... Uh, I mean, they didn't use any of the conspiracies we've heard, like the uh, the birth conspiracy, or or, or the you know the uh, born in Kenya theory. None of that stuff. It was just all basically what how D'Souza thinks Obama has developed his world view, uh, and uh, you know it's pretty provocative. And and I have to admit, a lot of it adds up if you really look and see what he's done. Well, they flat out said it right at the beginning, you know, Barack Hussein Obama was born in Hawaii. And there wasn't any doubt about it. They just went on. But it, the fact that it took, this this movie took in four continents was amazing to me. And the fact of, you know, uh, what was the name of uh, Obama's two books? It was uh, Dreams of My Fathers. And, and uh, Audacity of Hope. Right. And basically everything that was quoted in there were not... Dennis D'Souza's words, but Barack Hussein Obama's words. Yeah, I mean, the whole movie, he uses his own words, and of course, he he has a narrated version of his books, and he pretty much took his quotes from that, and they, they were direct quotes from the president, and uh, they were replayed in the president's words. You know, one thing he said about dreams from my father was the fact that it was, the book's not named Dreams of My Father, it was named Dreams from My Father, and that kind of, to me, connotes that that's what that's Obama's dreams, not his father's dreams. His dreams. I mean, that's the way. I, that's what I take away from it. Well, and and they they got into the whole uh, fact that Barack Obama Senior was kind of he got around, got a, kind of a ladies' man, and uh, he it was primarily Kenya and Indonesia, and with a side trip to uh, Hawaii. I don't want to give up the whole thing. I mean, it's, it's, this movie's worth going to see. Yeah, and he died in 1982. I don't know how many times he was married. You know, I, I know he had at least two marriages, and I think probably more than that. I think in the movie he said, you know, my memory's so bad, I can't remember. I know he talked definitely about two different marriages that uh, Brock Sr. had. So, But very interesting. We are waiting on the executive director, and that is, uh, that's... Uh, John Sullivan. <laughs> You know, that's a tough name. John Sullivan. And John is the co-writer, co-director, and executive producer of 2016 Obama's America. Uh, the unexpectedly strong-performing documentary 
which is Sullivan Notes, is performing well even in the bluest of blue enclaves such as Manhattan and L.A. Now, uh, hopefully, John, uh, there he is. I can hear the phone ringing right now, so he's almost right on time. But yeah. we'll be hearing from John. Um, if the folks out there want to call in and ask a question, we can uh, take that call at 812 812- Eight zero one three zero six four. That's eight one two eight zero one three zero six four. Christine will take the call and she'll relay your question to us that we can then relay to John. So we're hoping that uh, some of you will call in. I know a lot of you have seen the movie. Some of you that haven't, we don't care. You can call in anyway. This Rick and Rick at night, the voice of liberty here in the Ohio River Valley. John, are you there? I'm here, Rick. How are you doing? We're doing great. Glad to hear from you, pal. I mean, this this great movie. I mean, we're we're, uh, Barry finally saw it last night. He got to get out of the house, but uh, it, it, just a great movie. We, we were talking about it as far as the uh, uh, this was not a, a right wing cabal put this together. You got several uh, uh, like twenty five different uh, guys got together and, and pooled some money and, and put the get the movie together. And, and I think you, you uh, borrowed money to market it, but uh, this was not a George Soros kind of thing. No, no, nothing of that uh, in any way, shape, or form. It just kind of shows what, you know, when people can come together and uh, get behind the project, what can happen. Um, as we said, it wasn't a right-wing cabal that kind of put this together. It was, you know, investors um, that really stood behind the niche and uh, that made it happen. How did, how did you meet up with Dinesh? Uh, well, um... We, Dinesh and I met a few years ago through a mutual friend to talk about working on another project. Um, and uh, we, were, we were meeting over lunch about this, and he said, well, i got to put all this other stuff on hold for a while because I'm going to be writing this book, finishing up this book on Obama, and I have a different perspective on him and everything else. And I said, Dinesh, I would put everything on hold. I mean, yeah, let's put all these other projects on hold. I said, that's the project you should focus on turning into a documentary um, is that one versus anything else. And, uh, you know, that book turned out to be The Roots of Obama's Rage, which became a New York Times bestseller. And uh, we met shortly after that, um, that fall of 2010, and started talking about it. You, were, you, were look, you, you obviously looked ahead to the, the election because the timing's perfect. And this was not a hit piece. This was uh, a very quiet, deliberative, logical uh, presentation of really the president's old, wor- old words and his uh, life journey. Yeah, I mean, you know, Dinesh is not somebody who's going to be out there just kind of uh, pulling ambush interviews and kind of, you know, putting together a street and uh, something of that nature. He's, you know, this is a very thoughtful documentary, as you, you said, it's a very thoughtful film. Um, and he said it's told in the, uh, the president's own words are used um, throughout the film. So this is the president informing us on his own psychology, his own decision making, uh, what's important to him. And what you know ultimately forms the decisions he's going to make yeah john this is rick berry and i was i was struck and you know it appears to me that dinesh he's looked at his family history he's looked at his friendships throughout his life then he's looking at the things that he's doing as president and he's i don't know if you want to call it a theory but it's a pretty good darn good argument as to why we're seeing the president do the things he's doing based on his life history ever since he was a child and the people that he hung out with and i think that the movie did or the documentary did a great job of bringing that out well thank you and yeah that was ultimately our goal in in making the movie is to say hey look at what's the internal psychology what's the compass or you know the way we phrase it in the movie is what is the dream that that is guiding obama and you know he gives us as we state in the movie, he gives us a very good indication with a book he wrote, his first autobiography called Dreams from My Father. And if you really look at what his father's dreams were, his actions are mirroring that right now as we speak and are being enacted, you know, right now from the White House. Have you got any idea at this point, John, uh, how the movie is doing at this point? I know the last I heard it had done $30 million and it was the second most successful uh, political documentary in history has that uh, has it gotten the number one yet? Uh, no, uh, it's it's still the number two political uh, documentary. The number one is Fahrenheit 9/11 at 120 million dollars. So we have quite a ways to go to catch that one. Um, we're at about 30. Uh, we did a, uh, we're about 32 million dollars over the weekend uh, and poised to take over the number four spot. 
uh, right now for all time for documentaries. Um, only behind Fahrenheit 9-11, March of the Penguins, and uh, uh, Justin Bieber, unfortunately. <laughs> hey, and so, John, uh, am I correct in my thinking that uh, I'm just guessing that Michael Moore's movies, including Fahrenheit 9 I bet they got glowing reviews on all the networks, <laughs> on CNN, on MSNBC, and on, by most of the critics. And I bet you're, you're going to have a hard time getting your movie even mentioned on these networks, except maybe for Fox News. And I went to the Rotten Tomatoes movie site, and of course... The viewers that watch it, they always have a category for the viewers that went and saw it. Almost 80% liked it, and almost none of the critics did. So there you go. No, you're exactly right. That's exactly what's kind of been played out here. You know, had this been uh, Michael Moore, we would have had, you know, a two-page spread in the New York Times and a write-up here and CNN and everybody else with glowing reviews. And, uh, no, exactly as stated, it's basically been ignored by the mainstream media um, in that sense. Um, and it's just, uh, the user-generated reviews, uh, which last time I checked was about 10,000 of them, um, it's about 80%. And, you know, the, the critics, you know, have put in... What's funny to me is to hear a movie critic start talking about foreign policy. If you ever want to have a comedic <laughs> moment is have a movie critic talk about foreign policy because they really don't know which one to end is up. Well, you know, another thing that struck me about that uh, Rotten Tomatoes site, too, when, when the movie first came out, I think set, there was eight reviews, and I think seven of the eight liked it, gave it a positive review, and then all of a sudden there was a flood of about 20 negative reviews, and they put all the negative reviews at the top of the page and put all the positive ones down at the very bottom. I've never seen that done before, either. Yeah, well, you know, there, there's been a lot of kind of, uh, you know, sleight of hand that's happened with this movie against it. Um, you know, everything from the AP coming out with what they call the fact check, which was nothing more than opinion masquerading as fact. We rebutted every single point that they made, um, including the fact that they never, ever once talked to us about the film or the claims they were trying to refute in the film, uh, that they also misquoted the movie. Uh, they never asked us for a transcript of the movie so they could get that correct. Um, so they took things way out of context. Uh, and then on top of that, you know, we've even had the, the president uh, respond to his campaign uh, to the movie. Again, with bogus claims, uh, all of which we reviewed. Um, and was very. their response was a very clumsy one, uh, probably the most clumsy I've seen of anybody. Well, I did see one of the claims that I think the president refuted was that... Uh and you say in the movie that we were going to make Brazil one of uh, we we were going to be one of Brazil's best customers when it came to oil. Yes. And I heard the president myself and watched him on TV say that, so I couldn't understand why they would try to refute that one. No, I mean, yeah, what they're trying to say is, well, you know, we haven't really lent these con- countries uh, money to do offshore drilling or refining or any of the, the things we won't allow our own to happen in our own country. Um, to get us to oil independence um, or energy independence, excuse me, uh, on that side. And the other thing they tried to refute too, they said, well, the president has spoken out many times about American exceptionalism, and then they link back to when the president speaks about, well, I believe there's American exceptionalism, just like the British feel there's British exceptionalism and the Greeks feel there's Greek exceptionalism. Well, if everybody feels they're exceptional, nobody's exceptional. Translation, there's nothing special about the United States of America in his eyes. And exactly. The fir- and- yeah, and, and this demonstrates again, you know, they were trying to say that this is how this president thinks of it. Yeah, we're exceptional uh, in that way. And as you just stated, it demonstrates that he doesn't think we're exceptional at all. But that also fits in, uh, John, this, the other, the taller, better looking Rick. And we're Rick and Rick at night here in, in uh, the Voice of Liberty here in the Ohio River Valley. And we're talking to uh, 2016 uh, executive producer and director, John Sullivan. John, uh, part of this fits in, uh, you know, everybody thinks the president's a Muslim. Well, I think Dinesh and you guys pretty much dis- disputed that. It's not so much he's a Muslim. It's just so the fact that it fits in with his worldview as far as the, our country should have a smaller footprint in the world. And this, you know, with the the, the uh, events in the last week, you know, this fits into that. We're sitting there, we're the bad guys. He's, you know, blaming us, but that is has nothing to do with the Muslim thing. It has to do with his worldview that he inherited. No, you're absolutely right. You know, it's it's not the fact that he's a secret Muslim or or anything of that that part of it. He's very sympathetic to the to the Arab world um, and to Muslims. Uh, 
throughout the Middle East. And because of that is because, you know, he sees us as being this colonial power that's moved into the Middle East, whether it be the Shah in Iran, uh, whether it be Mubarak in Egypt, whether it be the formation of Israel. Uh, we've just established colonial our colonial footprint there, and his anti-colonial worldview works against that. Look, at, if he was truly, you know, a Muslim, you know, he probably wouldn't have taken out Osama bin Laden. Um, you know, he wouldn't have taken out Gaddafi, who was seen as a hero um, in the black Muslim uh, community here in America. So those don't really, that doesn't really hold water. What does hold water is the fact that he's an anti-colonialist, and he sees us putting our, our colonial footprint on the rest of the world, and that's why, you know, he's going to pull America back so that the rest of the world can rise up. John, have you heard, do you, do you feel, are we winning any converts, or are we, are we just speaking to the choir? Well, you know, sometimes when, when they talk about this, you know, preaching the choir is okay, you know. Um, and one way is the fact that, you know, you need the choir energized going out there and, and speaking about, you know, talking to pe- their friends about uh, who Barack Obama is, um, how this president thinks, because this information is not getting out into the mainstream media. But I do think, you know, we get a lot of feedback from our Facebook page, which is our most direct, uh, quickest form of response. And we get a lot of people saying, look, I voted for President Obama in 2008. This movie may be making me rethink him, um, who he is. Uh, I don't have the same kind of energy. I don't believe in hope and change anymore. Uh, so I think that people are getting the message. I think it's actually informing people as to who President Obama is uh, and helping them to make a decision uh, coming up. What's your website, John? Uh, you can visit us at 2016themovie.com. Again, that's 2016themovie.com. And this is Rick and Rick at Night. We're talking to John Sullivan, the executive producer and director of 2016. And, John, part of the uh, uh, the thing as far as anti-colonialism, could, could you say what colonialism is and what anti-colonialism is? Yeah, if I could just say what it is. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So the, the version of you know, colonialism is basically where you had a, an outside country going and establishing a colony, uh, this happened, you know, Britain was probably the, the most well-known of this. You know, America itself being a colony of the Uni- uh, Britain, uh, when we kind of threw that off in 1776, you know, there's a few that could say, oh, we were anti-colonial, we've been hit with this. But, oh, we were anti-colonial. But, you know, I hope the niche doesn't learn about these guys, Jefferson, Washington, and Franklin. But the anti-col- that colonialism, uh, anti-colonialism shows liberty, it shows free markets, uh, it shows self uh, determination and independence versus the anti-colonialism we're discussing and the one that informs Barack Obama is the one that establishes in its 20th century here and this is the one more related to you know we see in Africa and Kenya itself which earned independence in 1963 what this says is look at it's left leaning it's collectivism uh, leaning that way uh, and it's basically it's anti-western anti-free markets anti self uh determination. Uh, it's really about collectivism. It's got a Marxist leaning to it. Uh, it's a very different feel uh, that happens about social planning, uh, again, versus self-determination and free markets. So they're two different kind of anti-colonialisms or two pathways out of colonialism uh, that can happen. And unfortunately, the one our president chose is not the one of Jefferson, Franklin, and Washington. And John, one of the first things I think you point out in the documentary is uh, the fact that uh uh, President Obama sent back the bust of Winston Churchill, uh, and I, of course, our press, being who they are, have never really questioned him as to why he did that, um, other than just to let it let it slide and let it go under the rug. Yeah, I mean, and what he did is he, he offended one of our longest-standing allies in Britain. You know, it's often quoted that we have a special relationship um, with Britain, and the reason why he did that with the Churchill bust is. You know, Churchill was the undersecretary of colonies. Uh, he was the one that put us down the Mau Mau uprising in the 1950s, um, which, you know, are reported that both Barack Obama Sr. and uh, Barack Obama's grandfather were interned during that time, uh, during the Mau Mau uprising. So, you know, he has a lot of animosity towards Churchill uh, and towards England in general uh, because of their colonial footprint that they had around the world. And that's you know, why he returned the Churchill bus. Even though the Brits said, hey, it's on loan. We'd love to extend it to you guys. Uh, you know, we'd love to have you guys have it and uh, keep it in the Oval Office. 
And Obama said thanks, but no thanks, and sent it packing back to the uh, British ambassador. Well, you know, it's one of those things, I think, in, in our media, and a lot of people that uh, are li- liberals will say, well, you know, that's really no big deal. And I guess, considering the way the world is now, it's probably really not that big a deal. But then again, it is. You know, this this is our greatest ally, and, uh, you know, it sends a message. And we're seeing here now that he's doing the same thing with Israel, don't you think? Oh, absolutely. I think what he's done in, in kind of a turning Netanyahu's um, visits, uh, overtures for visits, uh, requests for visits, um, all that and kind of saying keeping it a, at arm's length distance is definitely, I think, becoming more than they can even handle. Uh, you know, and are, I'm surprised I haven't seen publicly some sort of uh, statement or issuance or, you know, declaration here um, from Israel of talking about, you know, how, how they're feeling. I mean, I, I have friends who live in Israel, uh, friends who have family in Israel, and they're telling me that they feel very abandoned, they're feeling very alone right now, and that America has turned its back on Israel, um, who's been our, you know, our single biggest ally in that region. And yet we see that the president, he has, sorry, Rick, I know Rick's waiting to get in there, but I keep cutting him off. <laughs> but... The, the thing that drives me crazy, and I know even the staunchest supporters have to be wondering, he has time for all these simplistic things. I think he was on The View this morning. He partied with Jay-Z and Beyonce. Um, he was on David Letterman last week, and he's uh, he was on some talk show, other talk show this morning. So he see, appears to have time for all these uh, menial things. But not time for the most important things, which, you know, if the, if the Israel situation isn't one of the most important things we're, we're facing in the last 20 years, I don't know what it is, and he won't even meet with our prime minister. No, you're absolutely right. I mean, we have the, basically the Middle East is burning right now. I mean, the Middle East is in turmoil, like, you know, maybe we've never seen in our lifetime. You know, 1979 might have been the closest this happened, you know, when uh, the hostages were taken in Iran. Uh, during that, but you know, our our ambassador to Libya was killed. Um, you know, this, you know, that, as close as you can get to assassination attempt on one of our higher officials. I mean, this is, you know, basically an act of war um, to any other administration, and yet here it's being act, acted out like it's really no big deal. Uh, these are just a bunch of you know angry people kind of working out their frustrations over some random movie. Well. That isn't the case. You have the Middle East, which is really on fire right now, with the hottest anti-Western sentiment, anti-American sentiment we've ever seen. Um, And it's moving more and more toward a radicalized position of Islam than ever before. And Dinesh said that uh, we've got, there's one more country that needs to fall in order that it become the United States of Islam. And that's Saudi Arabia. And that's scary. Uh, this is Rick and Rick at night. We're talking to uh, John Sullivan, the executive producer and director of 2016. One more thing as far as the anti-colonialism. I don't want to miss the United States of Islam either. But uh, Dinesh, and I, I regard you guys as friends, okay? And this, this struggle to get our country back, you're, you're right in the thick of it. Um, Dinesh said uh, Obama's anti-colonialism is essentially a system of global redistribution. Redistribute redistribute America's wealth to other countries and America's power to other countries. I mean, that kind of fits in with his, his view here domestically. At some point in time, you got enough wealth, and we're going to give it to other people. It, it, it's scary. We're going to we're gonna learn how everybody else lives. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, it's just... Um, the, the question is, <laughs> are you hopeful? <laughs> Am I hopeful? Well, I'm hopeful in the American people. I really am. I think that, you know, we're, we're a, a group of people that, you know, we, we swing right, we swing left, um, that hopefully there's corrective. Um, and I, I even see here, you know, for the most part, I think even Democrats for a long time thought we were having a, a conversation about liberal, conservative, Democrat, Republican. Um, I'm getting comments from people that are staunch Democrats that are finally understanding through seeing the movie and doing their own investigation afterwards and saying, look, it, this guy is not, you know, what I thought he was. This guy is a, looking to be a citizen, a global citizen of the world, and have America be one nation amongst many there at that table versus being the leader of the free world and leading by example 
um, and looking out for the best interests of America, rather he's going to take, you know, what people call beating from behind and take a, a position of just sitting at the table while other countries all decide, you know, hey, I'll be a global citizen. I don't want to upset anybody that way. So on that side of it, too, he's looking to redistribute wealth, not just within America. You know, we might see somebody like a Ted Kennedy do that. He's talking about redistributing wealth globally. Um, you know, and this stems directly from his father and his father's viewpoint um, of how the wealth of Kenya was stolen by the West. And just as you said, Obama sees it as saying, hey, you guys have earned enough. You know, it's time to redistribute the wealth around the, the world now. Well, John, the thing is crazy is the things that are coming out now, if we had a responsible press, the things that are coming out now would have come out four years ago. Uh, but there was no curiosity. I mean, I know you and Rick and I and many others kind of knew this past history, and we tried to educate some of our friends. I know I talked to a good Democrat friend of mine, and I said, you know, and I brought up Frank Marshall Davis. I brought up Bill Ayers. I brought up Jeremiah Wright. I brought up the fact that uh, uh, that uh, the president's grandparents were, I think they were pretty much communists, and I think his, his mother was a socialist. And throughout his history... That is his influence, has been these type of people. So I said to my friend of mine, I said, you know, these associations, and it seems to be that all of his associates are kind of radical. I said, does that bother you at all to think that that's who he hangs out with or who he has hung out with his whole life? And this friend of mine says, no, it doesn't bother me one bit. So, <laughs> I mean, it's really, it's just mind-boggling that uh, we're dealing with that kind of mindset, and now they're seeing the fruition of uh, possibly what this guy really is and what he's doing to our country. Well, I do think that there's a, a group in the middle that, you know, really voted for hope and change. They wanted to vote, you know, they were tired of politics as usual. They thought this was an antidote to that. Um, but at the same time, there is a group on the left that is, you know, sitting there and they're like, look, we don't like U.S. hegemony. We don't want, you know, U.S. dominance anymore in the world, you know, uh, marketplace. You know, we need to kind of, this is the whole Occupy mentality. And you know what? That's a large part of the left. You know, that mirrors exactly kind of the mainstream left. It's not kind of a, a, a weird perversion of that. It is that, just acted out. Um, so we do have a large, I mean, and I would say a significant part of, of the left, the hard left, that mirrors that thought exactly. So that doesn't surprise me that somebody would say that. However, I think there's a large part of America that leans Democrat, that think, that really thought they were going to get something different in Barack Obama, and he's not manifested that. And as we point out in the movie, his viewpoint isn't just the typical, you know, Kennedy, Clinton, Democrat viewpoint. It's something far, far different. No, we, we, we never felt this way. I mean, I, I yeah. my friends and I, that we talk, we talk about this, and it's therapeutic for us to talk about it, but we never felt this way under President Clinton. We never felt this way under President Carter. I mean, there were things we disagreed with and didn't like, but we never, I mean, people need to understand that we are absolutely terrified with what's going on, and I'm sure you yeah. and Dinesh are too. No, no, absolutely. And, and again, President Obama sees himself as a citizen, a global citizen of the world, not, you know, a citizen of the United States, looking after the United States' best interests. He comes out of school, as you were talking about, with his radical interests, Frank Marshall Davis, Bill Ayers, um, Edward Said. All of these guys have this viewpoint that, you know what, the U.S. is, is the rogue nation in the world. The U.S. is the bad guy. I mean, just look at Jeremiah Wright's sermons. Um, you know, his liberation theology is all about the United States being the bad guys. It's not about North Korea. It's not about Iran, um, you know, that are the, the bad guys of the world. It's the United States. And these are who have been his influences growing up from the age of 10 all the way through um, until his election as president. And, you know, this isn't anything new or anything that he's wavered into or just kind of fell in or had one random uh, you know, associate that was this. This is a pattern he's established. These are mentors he sought out himself. Well, John, I mean, it's, it's all right out there in front of us, and it's pretty obvious, and it's really not that hard to, to connect the dots. And I want to say to our audience, and I think I speak for you, I speak for Rick, we take no pleasure in talking ill of the president. No. I, I wish I wish this wasn't happening. I wish it was uh, things were normal, and, uh, you know, I'm I'm 56 years old. I'm it's a time of my life. I'm supposed to be kicking back and enjoying things. And now all of a sudden I feel like I got this fight. I know you feel the same way. Um, 
I hate talking about the President of the United States like this. I think we're being respectful, but we're also pointing out facts that people hardly just can't hardly ignore. No, you're, I think you're absolutely right. I wish, at the end of the day, I wish we wouldn't have had the May 2016 uh, Obama's America. I wish that, you know, the media would have done their job in 2008 um, in vetting this president. Um, I don't think we'd be in the situation today had that happened. Uh, you know, and people are coming up to us afterwards saying, I never knew this information. I'd never heard this before. This is the first time I've heard this information. You know, people are upset. Why have I not heard this before? Um so I think, you know, from that standpoint, I think, you know, we've tried to tell people uh, the information we found out about President Obama through the story. Uh, some of this has been out there already. And for a lot of people, they said, look, you just put the puzzle pieces together for me. I knew this part. I knew about Frank Marshall Davis. I kind of knew about some of his anti-Israel sentiments. But, man, you guys just put it all together for me for the first time. And it, it, it is fantastic. Again, I want to recommend the movie 2016. I saw it last night, and uh, Rick saw it last week, and uh, millions of people have seen it. And even if you don't believe in what we're saying, go see it and try to educate yourself and draw your own conclusion. No, John, absolutely. I would, yeah, go, ahead, go ahead. No, no, I was, I, that's exactly it. For us and for me, look, I want to have a vigorous debate um, and dialogue about, you know, our politics and where our country is heading. Um, you know, it's, I, I've been on record before saying, hey, I wasn't even a big Bush supporter or Bush, big Bush fan. I think there need to be dialogue and debate around that, too. So from this standpoint, you know, if we have a, an, a, an informed electorate, we have an informed group of people out there educating other people, talking about these issues, to me, that's only a good thing. So even if you don't agree with us, please, you know, see the movie um, and then, as you said, educate yourself. Find out what, what you disagree about or do more research on it and, and figure it out. Well, because, you know, we've because had, yeah, go ahead. No, I mean, we've had the AP come after us and we've had President Obama come after us. So our responses are easily found. They're even found on our website. If you go to 2016themovie.com, uh, we have a point-by-point -point, uh, reputation of what the president came after us about. Um, and explain why they were wrong or, or uh, weren't telling the whole truth. Absolutely. You know, and John, I think because of guys like you, and we're going to have to end this, we have another guest on hold, but I think because of people like you and Dinesh and Gerald Mullen and, and, and the Tea Parties, I think there's a groundswell out there that is bigger than anybody realizes. I think it's going to come to fruition November 6th. I really do. I have to believe that. I don't believe the polls. I think that uh, most of the American people get it, and I think uh, there's going to be a, some big surprises come Election Day. Wow. Well, uh, well I guess November 6th, we'll see if you're, if you're prophetic or, uh, or wrong. <laughs> <laughs> But, hey, appreciate you coming on. We could have had you on for a couple hours. We say that to all our guests, but really could. We just we just touched the surface, and I wish uh, there was so much more about the documentary we could have talked about. But we have the Lieutenant Governor Sue Elsperman, Elsperman on hold. And, John, thank you so much for being on our show. Hey, no problem, guys. Thank you for having me. All right. We'll get you again. All right. Oh. This is Rick and Rick at night, the voice of liberty here in the Ohio River Valley. And we just got done talking with John Sullivan, what a fantastic guy! Uh, you know, it just a, a half hour is not long enough. It no. just—I uh, mean, I don't even feel like we really got into the meat of the documentary, but we kind of got a good overview. Well, Tom and Kristen keep, you know, charging us confiscatory rates. And, you know, <laughs> yeah. and, uh, he goes out and get a beer afterwards. <laughs> I, don't, I don't get this. But, uh, we uh, uh, do we have uh, okay, uh, Madam Lieutenant Governor. Yes. Oh. I'm here. And she answers to it. That's good. That's a good positive sign. All right. <laughs> this is Rick Roos. I met you a weekend ago up at Randy Fry's up in Greensburg. Oh, yes, yes. Welcome good to Rick and Rick at Night Show. Again. Well, thank you for having me. Good to have you, Sue. This is Rick Berry. Hi, Rick. And, Rick, do you want to inter introduce uh, Madam Lieutenant Governor? Yeah, Sue, I'd like to just say that uh, Sue is Mike Pence's pick for Lieutenant Governor. And, Sue, I, if I read this whole resume, we'll have about two minutes left to interview you at the end of the show. I'm just going to get hit on some high points that uh, sure. in November 2010, Sue was selected state representative for District 74, representing Warwick, Spencer, Perry, and Dubois County in southern Indiana. Sue is the founding director of Center for Applied Research at the University of Southern Indiana. 
For 20 years, Sue operated her own consulting firm as a simplex creative problem-solving master consultant, complemented by a Ph.D. in industrial engineering, focused on the enhancement of individual and team problem-solving performance. Sue holds a BSIE from Purdue and an MSIE and a Ph.D. from the University of Louisville. And I'm going to stop right there, but I only touched on about 10% of your resume. It is quite impressive. Well, that's plenty. That's plenty. (laughs) So thank you. Thank you so much. You know, Sue, I want to ask, how, how, did, uh, how did it come about? Can you describe how Mike asked you to uh, be his lieutenant governor, how that transpired, and, uh, you know, I'm sure how you felt after that? Well, it, um, the process started in late April when I got a phone call from one of his staff members to campaign staff to say, was I interested in being in the short list? And, I was very cool on the phone, and I said, well, let me talk to my husband and pray about it, and can I get back with you next week? And then after I got off the phone, I went over to my computer and Googled the name of the staff members just to make sure that the invite was real. (laughs) Because you you can imagine being a two-year legislator, that was probably the furthest thing from my mind um, being considered. And then there was very a very thorough vetting process to look at, you know, how how were Mike and my philosophies in terms of our political views and backgrounds and, um, you know, how would we work together, et cetera. So that process went on for several weeks, and then Mike gave me a call one afternoon and and asked if I would uh, be his lieutenant governor, but he said, don't give me an answer yet. I'd like your husband and my wife and you and I get to ha- have dinner together because our families are going to be very tightly linked over the, the future years if we move forward. So we met the following evening in Columbus, Indiana, and uh, as you know, the Pence family is just fabulous. I was going to say, that sounds like Mike. Yes, yes, very thoughtful. Well, he's he's uh, been on our show, and and I I know that uh, Randy Fry and and Judd McMillan have sung your accolades even before uh, you were picked, um, and they're kind of tea party kind of guys. But uh, oh, by the way, we're going to have a, a a tea party down here October twentieth. I don't know if you, how's your schedule. I know your schedule's all over the state, but uh, we we have well, a little. I am writing down October twentieth, and I will send that through our scheduler. But you just mentioned two of my favorite legislators in Judd McMillan and Randy Fry. I mean, we we really were blessed to have a talented and committed class of legislators in our 2010 House. So those two are as good as it gets. And they've they've spoken at our tea parties before. And and I, and I the reason I, I keep emphasizing the tea party, Sue, it is just kind of. Uh, we kind of been vilified, but we're the conservative branch. It seems like of the Republican Party kind of thing. Um, but it's just we we expect an awful lot. And 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 Judd and and Randy, they they sit there. How are we doing? You know. And if if things aren't happening right way, get in touch with us. And uh, Mike Pence has been right there uh, as far. As, and we're part of the sixth district now, so it's kind of a amorphous thing. We we were in ninth, and now we're in sixth. But um, basically hewing to the canons of, of uh, fiscal conservative uh, conservatism yeah. and um, um, I know that th- you've got uh, the roadmap for Indiana I think that did that kick off today yes we rolled that out this afternoon uh, in downtown Indy <coughs> had a great crowd and a great response and that's uh, what's the website Sue do you have that or is it is it roadmap for Indiana.com or you know um, I should have that but if you get on the Mike website i'm sure the roadmap will be very prominent uh, and i encourage people to read it because it really does share uh, what we will do for indiana how we will move forward and as as true conservatives you know that is not making government bigger it is making the government that we have and need to have work for the people of indiana so i think people will be very very pleased if they will take the time to read the six goals and then click under each of them and see the 40 plus policies that will support continuing Indiana's movement forward. Sue, did you and Mike uh, work on these goals together? Pretty much, I'm assuming you did. By the time I joined the team, and boy was that a wonderful team to join in late May, the 
obviously the process was uh, already underway. It had it's been about 18 months of listening for Mike. So I was coming in towards the end of that listening phase and policy team leaders and members from across the state, more than 300 in total, were uh, brought in as, as uh, key stakeholders and uh, sharing their thoughts based on what we had heard across the state of Indiana and then shaped the challenges and the proposed solutions. And I certainly weighed in uh, in that latter part of that process as uh, in the polishing parts of the policies, but boy, the work that was being done was fabulous. You know, I spent 20 some years helping companies do problem solving and strategic planning, and I can tell you that the thoroughness by which we have studied the key issues of Hoosiers and defined the problems well and defined workable solutions, appropriate solutions for Indiana is pretty powerful. I'd like to take credit for them, but I think the credit goes to many, many, many uh, Hoosiers who volunteered their time to work on those policy teams and really put forth great ideas. Are there any one of these uh, six policies that, that you feel like you will be specializing in or more involved in than the others? Well, in terms of the goal, certainly um, anything that deals with agricultural and rural affairs will be under the lieutenant governor's bailiwick, as you know, as secretary of agriculture and rural affairs. So there are some specific policies like the development of a food and agriculture innovation corridor, which is very exciting because it takes the innovations coming out of our research university, Purdue primarily in that case, along with about agri-sciences and Alanco, animal sciences, et cetera, and really helps us to leverage those innovations and commercialize those in Indiana. And it's, well, it sounds like this is already one of your areas of expertise. Well, I'd like to say agriculture overall is, but I do not have, of all my degrees, I don't have a minor or a major in agriculture. <laughs> so, I, but I, I grew up in rural, if that counts. I certainly intend to become well-studied in agriculture and uh, am just, uh, you know, see it as a big area of economic opportunity for Indiana. And then a second area I'll probably play heavily, economic development is an area uh, that I've worked in for a number of years now, and we have an Indiana Applied Research Enterprise, which really is focused on leveraging all of the intellectual property coming out of our universities, as well as places like Naval Surface Warfare Center Crane. Uh, and the life sciences to, again, commercialize the intellectual property that we're creating in Indiana to create those new products and new jobs, high-tech jobs, high-wage jobs for Indiana. And we're, we're in a very good position to do that, but just need to kind of figure out that last little piece of how to accelerate the innovation. Well, that's good to hear, Sue. You know, I'm on the city council here in Madison, and... Uh Boy, one of the one of the biggest points of contention and emphasis on our council is is economic development. And uh, you know, a town like us, it, it, it's uh, twelve thousand people, and we're not close to the interstate. We're about twenty miles from the interstate. Yeah. Uh, it's a real battle for us. And uh, you know, I'm hoping I'm going to plug Madison in front of you. The hope that uh, maybe we can work with you, or I can work with you, uh, getting to know you a little bit uh, as far as what we can do here in Madison. I don't know if you've ever been to Madison. It's a beautiful town. I it, have. It, it My really husband is. and I spent a nice weekend uh, there at a bed and breakfast we just had a wonderful time well a lot of so, people say yeah, yeah my town is beautiful but you know what our town really is beautiful it, it, it absolutely <laughs> is so is. even though we're not close to an interstate uh, yeah hopefully down the road uh, maybe you and i'll talk again or we can have you talk to our council and maybe we can get something moving with our economic development down well, here and i think what you're experiencing in madison is similar to many of our rural counties across indiana and Last year, one of my pet pieces of legislation didn't quite get across the finish line. It was a, a to drive rural economic development, particularly rural entrepreneurship, um, to grow the, the jobs in our rural communities. And uh, I think we'll take a second shot at that this coming year. I've got several legislators who've already asked if they can author that bill that I had offered. And maybe in my new position, I'll have a little more influence to get that through because I, like you, I've watched, you know, what my, one of my reasons for saying yes to this position was watching the challenges of our rural communities, the brain drain particularly, 
across the state in, in my part of southern Indiana where I was representing, we were seeing 15 to 25 percent of our young adult population over the last decade leave, which is at 25 to 40 solar year olds. And you can't afford that trend for very many decades or you won't have much of a hometown left. And so we know we have to do the things that will attract young people back, everything from broadband to having those the quality of life in our communities. And I think, as you described Madison, Madison is on the right tracks there, but we have to do even more to make sure that we're attracting that young talent. And that's why entrepreneurship is a, is a significant part of that equation as well. So there are a number of things that, that we'll be cooking on and working on to try to work with communities to bring our young people back and make sure we have vibrant, smaller cities and small towns as well as our larger urban areas. This is Rick and Rick at Night, the Voice of Liberty here in the Ohio River Valley, and we're talking with Sue Elsperman, candidate for Indiana's Lieutenant Governor. She's running with a friend of the show, Mike Pence, who's running for governor. Sue, uh, now in the roadmap for Indiana goals, now I know that uh, the campaign put out a thing as far as a couple weeks ago as far as establishing an office of federalism. Now, I think that's caught under the, it's now it's a pushback against job killing federal regulations by establishing an office of state-based initiatives. I think that's the same thing. But I really like the idea of the idea, you know, as far as there is a constitutional role for the United States government, and there's a constitutional basis for the state of Indiana. And it seems like it's really gotten messed up. Uh, right. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're all feeling those mandates. And, uh, you know, you know Mike well enough, and uh, and I think we share this, that there, you know, we as a Hoosier state know what's best for Hoosiers and can solve our problems more effectively in many cases than the federal government can. And in fact, many times those federal mandates cost Hoosiers, so the Office of State-Based Initiatives will uh, be charged, tasked with uh, measuring the impact, the cost, the ROI to Hoosiers, and when appropriate and when we can to say no if that's the uh, best approach. And certainly we're seeing that with some of the recommendations around Obamacare, that we think there are better ways in Indiana to solve the health care uh, problem than uh, the Washington approach. Yeah, Mike's already said that he wants to opt out of Obamacare. I don't know if Mitch has, has come through on that yet. I know there's still a lot of an effort with that going on. Uh, yeah. But it's just, but what I would love for you in the executive branch to do is check the legislative uh, branch as far as there, you cut, what was it, $168 million over the last 10 years, that, you know, the, the General Assembly did but then enacted a new $80 million a year entitlement all day kindergarten. Well, wait a minute, that's $643 million more expense. That doesn't make any sense to us out here in the hinterland. And then, you know, the uh, uh, I know that deals get made and all that stuff and that, that, that smoking ban. I'm just sitting there going, I know it's not conservative and I'm pretty sure it's not Republican, but yet it was enacted through you know, the General Assembly. I want you to watchdog that stuff. Yeah. Well, and we are also putting in, you know, the, the one-year moratorium on our own state regulations, and I think that's where, you're, where you may be uh, focusing, is that we also uh, sometimes over-regulate ourselves. As a state, we can complain about what Washington does to Hoosiers, but sometimes we as state government do that. To Hoosiers as well. So the one-year moratorium there is really intended to go back and look at, again, uh, task Office of Management and Budget with looking at the impact of existing regulation on businesses and farms and individuals and then to make recommendations. And as we go forward to put a process in place that we do review policies in that way before enactment just as we would do a fiscal impact generally on a bill, that we would look at them from a more comprehensive way to the impact on Hoosiers, not just state government. So I, you know, your point is well taken, that if you're out there talking with uh, small businesses and farmers and folks on the street, those are the things that, that bother them considerably and, and do inhibit 
our job growth as well as our freedom. Well, and another thing, this is Rick and Rick at Night. We're talking to Sue Elsperman, candidate for Indiana Lieutenant Governor. And is the fact of property taxes. I know that hits agriculture. It hits everybody else. I've contended, and a lot of people have contended, that property taxation is immoral because you're basically getting taxed on that property or that monies that you've already been taxed on, and you get to give again. And that's I know that there was a big deal and all that, and I don't know if that was be- before you came in the General Assembly, yeah. but, but it's, still, yeah. it's still immoral. And, the, and particularly the, the farmers, they're sitting there going, you know, what one to do when we're getting hammered by so many different ways, yeah. and it's not an equitable way of taxation anyway. Yeah, we did, you know, I, I, I can see, see where you are on that. We, that did get enacted just as I was coming in. But the, um, the other piece is that we were able to phase out the inheritance uh, tax. So that's, you know, that the death tax, if you will. So we are in the process of, of eliminating, eliminating that, which is a real drawdown on agriculture and small business particularly. And I think the other is, uh, you know, if if we were to do the other, you've, we've got to have a stream, at least to the extent of the of the key fundamental required services of state government, that there is a funding stream to to handle those. So it, I think all of those things we share the commitment of wanting to uh, minimize that prop, that tax burden on Hoosiers. And Mike has proposed a 10% over the next two years uh, reduction in personal income tax, which we believe we can do, which would save the average family $225, the average small business $1,000. So those are steps in, a, in the right direction of, of lowering the tax burden on Hoosiers. Very good. And, and I'm, switch, I'm going to switch gears because we only got a few more minutes. But okay. as far as the illegal immigration that we have in the state of Indiana. And I, I made a I tried to make a case to Mitch when he was down here that if you go to Walmart here in Madison on a Friday or Saturday night, it's like a third world country. And I think I told you I do home health and hospice visits and on the way out between Lamb and Brooksburg, a guy was pooping on the side of the road. I'm just sitting there going, okay, this is anecdotes. But we got a problem because we've got people that are getting state welfare benefits, getting uh, all sorts of benefits from being here without contributing. And I, I don't see anything in the platform or the uh, uh, roadmap for Indiana as far as even speaking to that. Well, and I think because so much of that is federal, I think where there are, you know, in 2011, we did pass immigration legislation in Indiana uh, that, that dealt with the parts that Indiana could be most successful with in holding employers accountable, et cetera, to making sure that their employees are are legal. Um, so I think, you know, what we're seeing, especially with the courts, is we're doing what we can in Indiana absolutely nationally. We need to have a very strong immigration program. And as you know, our federal government just has not been willing to solve that problem. So, yeah, point well taken, but uh, you're right. It's not, because of the nature of it being a federal issue, is not one of the key planks in the uh, roadmap. You know, I think, uh, Sue, uh, one good thing about the Obama economy is uh, that that is sending a lot of the illegals back to Mexico yeah. and back yeah. to South America. So we can we can give the uh, president accolades for that. Um, this is Rick Berry, <laughs> Sue, and... Uh, <laughs> but... I think one thing I would hope you and Mike would be careful of, you know, it's always been the Republican platform to be a a small government, a a non-intrusive government. And, you know, I see the things with Governor Daniels. I think he's been a good good governor. But I see some things where uh, the government, state government's moving into uh, personal lives with a smoking ban, uh, some other things. And one thing I wanted to talk to you about, you know, 
with that in mind, it seems like you know we don't have a leg to stand on when we try to make an argument for small government when the Republican star- Party starts meddling too. But I wanted to touch on uh, the education system and uh, Tony Bennett's new program. When we talk about uh, meddling, I think Tony Bennett's got some great ideas. I like the competition standpoint and the, the accountability standpoint. But uh, there's there's part of his program. I think it's called the Rise Program. And uh, Sue, I'm sure you're getting feedback, but uh, the teachers I talk to are, are just fit to be tied, and uh, a lot of them say they no longer enjoy their job, and they're thinking about getting out of the profession. So uh, can you speak to that? Yeah. Well, I happen to be married to an assistant principal of a junior-senior high school, if you can imagine, and he's the frontline person to implement RISE. So you might guess I hear about it almost every night in some Good. way, shape, or form. You know, I, I do too. <laughs> the, the, yeah, okay, you did it. Um, the legislation that was passed two years ago really just put accountability into uh, that uh, job evaluation. It included some performance, and it and it ensured that we would no longer uh, promote teachers based on tenure. That that would not be the, the method, and that we would have the opportunity in Indiana to reward based on performance. All of that makes much sense to most of us who live in the private sector, are used to being evaluated in our job every year and being rewarded accordingly. Like, why should all teachers be paid the same thing when you have excellent teachers who deserve much more and and you have some who need serious coaching or maybe need to even look for other opportunities? Uh, down the road. So, Sue, we've got one minute. It's just the thing I'm okay. hearing is so many teachers are being required to uh, do things or pressured into feeling like they have to do things that, that don't have anything to do with the classroom. And that's what I hope you and Mike take a look at that. We're running out of time here, but I hope yeah. you and Mike will take a look at that. I know you're hearing it from teachers. I'm hearing it, and uh, I've got a daughter that's a teacher and a wife that's a teacher, so I, I, I hear it and uh, heard it at a homecoming at Franklin College this weekend from several teachers up there so hope you guys look at that really strongly we, we will certainly do that and work with our department of education and, and superintendent tony bennett but also recognize that all change is difficult and that transition is tough and so the, the whatever we can do to make that transition easier more palatable i think we should be looking to i love to hear you say that i think we got about what five seconds guys <laughs> sue thanks well, so much thank for being you. on the show my pleasure. Uh, I, I wish we had more time. Hey, we'll talk again, okay? Okay, look forward to it. We'll be back next month on October 22nd for another exciting episode of Rick and Rick at Night. We'd like to thank our friend Tom for working the board and our friend Lisa and Dr. Michael Israel for welcoming Patriots at Harry Stone Grill. Good night, Madison and America. God bless and keep you our listeners in the most wonderful country in the world. For our local audience, we're going to Harry Stone Grill on Clifty Drive across from Wendy's. Harry, tell us a poor one.